But this textbook says, the mixture at the bottom of the flask was rich in amino acids. Oh, come on, that is stupid. It was not rich in amino acids. Let's tell the kids what they really found, okay? He filtered out the product. As this gas went through the tubes, he sparked it, produced this goo at the bottom, and he drew the goo off, because if it went through again, it would be destroyed by the spark. Now, in real life, you're not going to get a section of the ocean protected. Secondly, what he made was 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid, 2% amino acids. So 98% of his mixture was poisonous to life. I would not call that a success. And there are 20 different amino acids, sort of like 26 letters in the alphabet, or 20 amino acids. Those amino acids go together to make proteins, like letters go together to make sentences. Mostly he made just two of these amino acids. And they bond with the tar and the acid very quickly, more readily than with each other. It was a failure as an experiment. Amino acids are like letters of the alphabet, sort of like building blocks. You have to have a bunch of amino acids to make a protein. Then you have to have a bunch of proteins to make a cell. And you got to have a bunch of cells to make an organism. And one cell is more complex than a space shuttle. And all he got was a couple of the amino acids. That's like me dropping toothpicks. And I happen to make a few letters of the alphabet. That's possible, isn't it? Toothpicks could fall in the shape of a T or an H, or an I, or an E. That's possible. But if I'm able to drop toothpicks and produce a few letters of the alphabet, should I therefore conclude that nobody wrote Webster's, Webster's Dictionary? He made the equivalent of a few letters, and he actually needed to make huge books. And half of his letters were backwards, left-handed. This creates a real problem since the simplest proteins, the smallest proteins, have 70 to 100 amino acids, all of them left-handed. This really compounds his problem. RNA and DNA are all right-handed molecules, and they are unbelievably complex. And hundreds of these amino acids must, be, must combine to make a protein, and this has to be in a precise order. And they unbond in water much faster than they bond, and last time I checked, the oceans are completely full of water. So Brownian motion is going to drive them away from each other, not together. It just isn't going to work. He did not make life in the laboratory. But they tell the kids, he showed how life could have started by itself. Oh, that is just a stupid, okay? That's a lie. He did not show anything of the kind. And every experiment since then has made the problem worse. They're finding more and more things that just couldn't happen. Don't call that science. But they tell the kids, you know, three billion years ago, life appeared on Earth. I was doing a, asked me to speak at this college in Boston one time. This preacher called all the colleges and universities around Boston and said, would you like to have Kent Hovind come speak at your college? Finally, one school, one professor said, yes, he can come speak at our school if our professors can ask him any questions they want because we want to show our students how dumb these creationists really are. So the preacher called me and said, Brother Hovind, would you like to speak at this college and let them make fun of you for a couple hours? I said I would be honored. <laughs> so uh, 
I showed up, there were six professors and all their students, you know, I felt like Daniel in the lion's den. I got my charts out and I said, now folks, I believe the Bible. <clears throat> Nobody cheered. I said, I believe about 6,000 years ago God made everything. The world's not millions of years old. 4.6 billion years ago, there was a big flood. I'm sorry, 4,400 years ago, there was a big flood, <laughs> not 4.6. 4 and 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and I gave him the basic Bible story, okay? Then I told them what they believe. Because most of them don't know what they believe, you have to tell them. <laughs> you guys believe 20 billion years ago there was a big bang where nothing exploded and produced everything. 4.6 billion years ago the earth cooled down, made a hard rocky crust, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. And this early life form found somebody to marry. <laughs> Boy, now that's a good trick. And something to eat, of course, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. One professor was getting kind of upset about this time. I seem to do that to them. He said, uh, Mr. Hoven, there are hundreds of varieties of dogs in the world. I said, yes, sir, you're right about that. He said, do you mean to tell me that you believe all these dogs came from two dogs off of Noah's Ark? You expect me to believe that? Ha, ha, ha. I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. <laughs>
This textbook says, all the many forms of life on earth today are descended from a common ancestor. What? You mean the birds and the bananas have a common ancestor? Isn't that what he says? Found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. Well, in the first place, there's no such thing as a primitive unicellular organism, okay? One single cell is more complex than a space shuttle. There's no such thing as a primitive single-celled organism. We talk about that on video number four of our series. But he says, all the forms of life are descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. What were those first cells like? How do we know? What events led up to their formation? No traces of those events remain. Did you catch that? Hey kid, we know what happened, but there's no proof. Primitive, huh? This one says, the humans, mammals, birds, crocodiles, all had a common ancestor. Well, anything inside that circle is religious speculation. It is stupid. Reptiles produce reptiles, dogs produce dogs, people produce people, and there's never been an exception to that. Darwin said, though, if my theory be true, here's his book right here. You can look on page 211. He said, if my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties must assuredly have existed. Boy, you're right about that, Charlie. I mean, to change from a rock to a dog would take a few changes. <laughs> David Ropp, who believes in evolution very strongly, says, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found, yet the optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks.